Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our first equitable and inclusive engagement uh, webinar. Uh, my name is Nicole Cabral. I'm the Associate Director for New York Engagement Programs at Public Agenda. And I'm joined with my friend and colleague, Paul Corey, who's a disability rights advocate. And hey, everyone. today is the first in a series of conversations that we'll be holding on issues that are really important around civic engagement, equity, and inclusion. Um, so we're tonight we'll be today we'll be talking about uh, how to create an accessible virtual meeting space, really um, looking at considerations for persons with disabilities. Um, this is a really important issue that we've been thinking about at Public Agenda, and we know others have been as well, um, especially in light of the pandemic and moving from face-to-face -face and more into face-to-face -face interactions to more virtual spaces. Um, it's created uh, an opportunity to be more accessible for many, but for those, um, for many others, especially persons with disabilities, there's a lot of limitations when you're moving um, engagement or your meetings to virtual space. So my friends, Paul and I just wanted to share some of our thinking and our experiences on this topic with you all and, and open up a conversation on the very important topic. So um, as we're getting started, I just wanted to mention a few housekeeping issues. Uh, the first one is this presentation will be recorded and it will be available to everyone after the presentation. Uh, the second um, is that we'll be using the Q&A function for any questions or reflections that you may have. So you'll notice uh, on the bottom of your screen, there's sort of a chat box icon that says Q&A. So feel free to use that to ask any questions that you may have. And we're gonna be stopping periodically throughout the, throughout the conversation to answer any questions that we, that we can. And we'll set aside time at the end of the presentation to do a little bit deeper dive in some of the questions and reflections. Um, we have, we're really excited because we have over 400 people registered for this webinar. So with that said, we probably will not be able to answer every question, but we're going to try our best to answer as many as that we can. Um, you all will be muted and there is not going to be an opportunity to unmute yourself. So if you have any uh, technical concerns, um, if the audio isn't loud enough or any concerns like that, you can just use the Q&A function as well to write out your concerns and we'll try to address them. Okay. And the final thing is if you're on social media we, and you're, you're talking about this conversation, we ask that you use the handle public agenda, P-U-B-L-I-C-A-G-E-N-D-A, -A, uh, one word, or hashtag public agenda when talking about this conversation. Okay, so who are we at Public Agenda? Public Agenda is a national nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. We do research and public engagement. So for us, research is deep listening and public engagement is problem solving around the challenges that we heard. Um, for us, it's really, really important to include uh, all voices and especially voices that have been historically underrepresented. And we strive to do that by making democracy uh, work for everyone, as well as expanding opportunity. Okay, just a little bit about engagement. Um, engagement is really all of the ways that folks can interact with each other. Now this can um, include circulating information, sharing ideas, discussing, deliberating around important issues. It could be also public work and volunteering. And it's really about um, engaging around issues and decisions that are important to people. Engagement is about relationships between people and the institutions that serve them. And it's also about the relationships amongst people. So we think of social capital in that way. Finally, uh, a public agenda. Engagement is also about meeting people where they are and treating them as adults. Uh, so I know we have a child in the, in the photo, but treating people as adults is really about treating people with respect, making sure that your engagement processes are legitimate, that they are respectful for people, um, that they're fun, that they're inclusive, and that they're equitable. 
Okay, so we have this photo here. It's a cartoon strip. In the cartoon strip, there's a man shoveling the snow off of the stairs, and there's a group of people in the background. So there's a person with a wheelchair that says, could you please shovel the ramp? The person shoveling the snow says, well, I, let me finish shoveling the stairs, and then I'll shovel the ramp for you. The person in the wheelchair says, could you just shovel the ramp first, and then we can all get in. The stairs can be used by some people and the ramp can be used by everyone. We might think of the ramp as something special. In relation to creating video conference platforms that are accessible, we should think of creating our presentations and trainings to be used by everyone and not by some people. Accessibility, accessibility is not something special that you do, but it's something that allows equal access. a little bit about ourselves. So again, my name is Nicole Cabral. I am originally from New Jersey, but my parents are immigrants from Jamaica. So I spent every summer in rural Jamaica and I currently live in Brooklyn, New York. And I sort of identify myself professionally and personally as a community builder, as well as a civic engagement specialist. A uh, few people know actually that I've danced professionally in a few companies. Um, I started uh, dancing actually before I was even three years old and danced as a teenager professionally um, and competed. And uh, as an adult, I've uh, joined two companies, an Afro-Brazilian dance company in Washington, DC, as well as an Afro-Cuban dance company in Washington, DC. Uh, some of my interests um, besides arts and engagement include equity and inclusion, as well as environmental sustainability. So my name is Paul and I'm a citizen of Jordan and the United States. I currently live in the nation's capital. I have a syndrome called charge syndrome, which makes me deaf and low vision. Having a disability, I struggled to find a hobby that I could enjoy. Luckily, as a disabled person, I, was a, I, was, I am a natural problem solver, which allowed me to find rock climbing. Rock climbing for me, it's been something I've been doing for 15 years. And then here in the US and abroad, I've enjoyed educating people about how to increase accessibility to help the disability community thrive. Awesome. And Paul's an awesome rock climber. He actually taught me how to rock climb. So I just want to mention that. Um, we thought it would be helpful to walk you through uh, what we'll be doing today. So we'll be exploring different types of disabilities, how to dress people with disabilities, as well as uh, disability etiquette, which we'll show you a brief uh, video on that. We'll also be talking about learning styles, the curb cut effect, and then jumping into how do you, some considerations when designing a virtual engagement. We're going to sort of uh, intermix the, the presentation and, and the conversation with some polling questions to just get a feel for, for what sort of platforms you all use um, when, you're, when you're engaging with the public. Um, we'll talk about some considerations in choosing the platform before and after your video conference um, sort of meeting or engagement interaction. We'll ask another polling question and then we'll jump into conversation. And uh, again, we're, we're all muted because we won't be able to unmute everybody. So it's going to be um, through the Q&A. So if you have also reflections that you want to share, um, please do. Okay, so there's two types of disability groups. So according to the Center for Disease and Control, one in four people have a disability. In the disability community, there are people with visible disabilities and hidden disabilities. People with visible disabilities have to disabilities that are visible to the naked eye. This could be a person who uses a wheelchair or an amputee. Many people assume that visible disabilities are the most common disability. Over 75% of people with disabilities have hidden disabilities. People with hidden disabilities have disabilities that are not physically obvious, such as a person with a mental health diagnosis or an autoimmune disorder. Sometimes people with more common disabilities, such as people with intellectual or developmental disabilities are also people with disabilities as well. Next slide. Sorry. Um, go back. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> All right. 
So they should always interact with a person with a disability. Some people with disabilities prefer identity first language and others prefer people first language. With identity first language, addressing the person's disability is seen as a positive trait because they value their disability as part of their identity or culture. Earlier in the discussion, I mentioned that I'm a rock climber. I would not say I'm a person who rock climbs. This is similar to identity first language. With identity first language, it puts disability as an identity category. Take for example, deaf people. They identify as being deaf first and they embrace who they are. Deaf people see themselves as people who can do anything but hear. They have their own language and cultural identity. Other people prefer using people first language, which puts the person first instead of the disability. People first language emphasizes on a person, who a person is and not what a person has. Okay. You'll notice that more often people with disabilities prefer identity first language as it identifies their disability as part of who they are. People first language separates the person from their disability. For example, a person who uses a wheelchair. You should also note that people first language was an idea of an able-bodied person to take disability out of how someone is identified. If you're not sure how to address a person with a disability, you can always ask. And you can also learn more about disability sensitivity by watching the video in the next slide. So I will queue up the video now. Good morning, Mom. Morning there. And morning, Alice. There's no need to be awkward. Poor Bob. Like so many of us, he just doesn't know how to interact with people with disabilities. It's pretty easy, really. People with disabilities are people first. We need the same things that every person needs, like respect. Good morning, everyone. Attention! Uh, okay. Maybe we need to be more specific. The easiest way to show respect is to focus on the person, not the disability. It's okay, you'll get the hang of it. One easy way to focus on the person is to watch the person signing and not their interpreter. Or their companion. It's really cool that you'd like to help, but do us both a favor and please ask me first. What you think might be helping? I got you. Wait, wait, ah! Oh no, it might actually not. If you'd like to offer me help, let me hold on to your elbow. Don't take mine. Hey, would you like to take mine? Sure. Assistive devices help us to live our lives. They're really important and really personal. Grabbing them only makes it weird for everyone. What? Please only touch our devices and service animals if we've given you permission. And don't take it personally if I ask you not to. Remember that my service animal helps me all the time. Neither of us would like it if we were separated. Remember, we make our own decisions. We sign documents, vote, volunteer, work, and pay taxes. We get married. So don't touch me just because I have a great smile. Just because I'm blind Man, help you? does not mean I'm deaf. Just because I'm deaf doesn't mean I'm blind. And just because I use a wheelchair doesn't mean that I can't sweep you off your feet. So take a deep breath, relax. We don't bite. Unless we're really hungry. Hello, ladies. How are you? Hello. And if you're not sure what to do, just ask. Hi, would you still like to see a menu? Uh, no, thanks. But can you please read it to me? Sure, definitely. Just treat us the way you would want to be treated, and we'll all be okay. Good 
morning. Good morning. Good morning, Alice. Hi. Awkward no more. Nice job, Bob. Go forth and be human. There's no need to be awkward. Okay. So, um, uh oh, hi. Um, we were thinking that we could stop and just take a, a few minutes to answer a couple of questions. Um, so I'll we'll take a look at the chat. Um, let's see. <laughs> Thank you, Laura Torchio, who said bravo. Um, Elizabeth Menchaca Gull, pardon me if I'm misspelling your name, um, asked for a link to the video. We'll be sure to share that. I hope everyone noticed the, one of the actors in the video. Uh, Paul um, had mentioned that he thought it was a really good way to just sort of um, share some information in a lighthearted way on disability etiquette. So thank you for that. Um, let's see, and there is um, a, a question. Oh, Rebecca Burkhoff said, great act, amazing acting, Paul. There is a question from um, one attendee. Um, if we do advocacy around internet access, um, availability for all people. Um, the person had said that elderly and persons that are economically disadvantaged are challenged with regards to virtual engagement. Um, so I'll just be, I'll answer that on behalf of public agenda. We don't really do advocacy, but we do work around engagement. And part of that is, is really making sure that there is an equ equity lens. So a, a lens really around fairness and accessibility. Um, and that's something that is that we, in, a, in addition to looking at issues relating to people with disabilities, um, it's also very important for us to think about folks that like exactly what you said, um, who are elderly and those that don't have access to internet. So in our work, um, we, we do work on those issues and we can, I can certainly uh, share information with you on some projects that we're doing that, that that looks at that. Um, we'll have both uh, my e or a public agenda email and Paul's email um, available, available to people after. Um, somebody is also asking, sorry about that. Um, Paul, what kind of language do you prefer? So I prefer identity first language because as a deaf person, that's who I am. That's how I identify. Um, sometimes it depends on the situation, like. Um, who I'm talking to. So if I'm doing something related to like work, I, I definitely say like who I am first so that people know, like, hey, this is a deaf person, so they know who I am. So I always use identity first language because that's who I am and that's what I'm proud of. And it's always important to ask people that question because a lot of times people don't know and they're like, oh, you're hearing impaired. And hearing impaired can have a negative connotation. So I just prefer being deaf because I can do anything but hear, right? So it's kind of like how I identify, yeah. If that answer the question. Okay. Um, and we, are, we have some questions um, about um, a better understanding of some of the, the work that we're doing. Um, again, I can share my email with folks as well as Paul's email. Um, and we can, we can, um, we can definitely share some information if that works for folks. Um, we have another question um, by Ruby Quanson. Thank you, Ruby. Um, she said, this is awesome and revealing. We all have so much to learn. I wonder if there are persons who will prefer identity first, pardon me, identity first to people first language and vice versa. And what is the best way to find out? I think you touched upon that a little bit, Paul, but if you can, if you have any other advice, that would be great. Sure. Um, sometimes it's kind of tricky when you're using people first language and when you're using identity first language. So some people with like mental um, or behavioral disorders, they don't want to be called, um, like they don't want to be called a person with bipolar. They just want to say I'm bipolar. Um, it just depends on the person. And then people with intellectual disabilities, like, it just depends on the situation, but it's always important to just ask the person that they might have a preference. It's the same as like, it's just an identity. And then also people first language is more of, that's what like the text should be. Like if you look at the ADA, they 
use people first language. That was the first what came up. And then they started getting that. And then the disability community became bigger and bigger and people in the disability community wanted to be identified by who they are and they're kind of proud of it. Whereas people first language says, I'm a person first and then I have a disability. Thank you, Paul. And we have a few more questions coming in, but we'll just, I'm gonna um, share one more question and then we'll try and answer the, the, the other questions during the next break. So one person asked, is, and I'm gonna ask you to answer this, Paul, if you don't mind, is it appropriate to use the term disability at all? It's, it's appropriate to use disability. That's how you should always go about it. You shouldn't just, um, you can always ask, but it's always appropriate to use disability. You can say like you're a disabled person, but you're saying you're identifying them as a disabled person. You're not, it's, it's not an insult. It's, it's, an, it's a category. It's, an, it's, it's, putting, it's like an identification category. You're identifying the person and putting them in a category. It's not offensive at all, but you can look at people first language and look at the website, um, just Google for people versus language, they'll show you what the right terms are to call people and what the wrong terms are to use. We can give you resources later on if needed. Wonderful, thank you, Paul. Um, and for me, I've learned a lot from just even this conversation. Um, I found it really helpful. So I'm going to uh, going forward, use identity first language. Um, so we thought it would be helpful to point out um, that people, a variety of people have different learning styles. So there's just different ways that they receive information. Um, there are many different learning styles, but I wanted to point out um, just a few that might be helpful for you to think through while you're engaging with a, a wide range of people. So first is the auditory learning style. Um, this learning style is characterized that by people who understand best through discussion. Um, and what could be helpful when working with persons who prefer an auditory learning style is um, incorporating or reinforcing what you're saying through sound. So incorporating videos or other forms of, of media in your interactions with persons who have an auditory learning style. There's also um, visual learning styles, so visual learners. And visual learners prefer images and maps, uh, diagrams and other graphics. And when you're thinking about working um, with visual learners, it, uh, a technique that is helpful is the use of whiteboards. And then you have kinetic or tactile learners. Now these are learners that learn best through experiencing. Um, they're very hands-on type people and they prefer interactive activities or activities that use utilize movement. Um, and they prefer sort of a variety of different types of ways that they can receive information. So as I was uh, learning about the subject, educating myself about the subject and talking to Paul, I really realized that it, you know, I've always thought that it's important to use different forms of um, different techniques when working with people, but I think having this variety and understanding that um, that there are different there are different ways that people um, receive information. It's really helpful to kind of know that and think through that as you're engaging with the public. Okay, um, have you ever heard of the curb cut effect? Um, it's a really interesting um, concept. So we have um, a picture of a curb cut. There's a lot of them out there and they're actually not very good, many of them, but this is a, a very good curb cut. So essentially the curb cut is sort of that little ramp from the sidewalk onto the streets. So in the United States, I, I actually know that there's some people on this uh, who've registered that are um, not in the United States, but in the United States, um, according to the Americans with Disabilities Act, it's mandated that you have to have a curb cut. So again, it's the ramp from the sidewalk onto the street. And originally it was created for, for people, for wheelchair users, right? So that they can easily traverse the street to the sidewalk, but it benefits everyone. When I have on high heels, it makes it easier for me to walk. If I have a stroller or a carriage, I can push it without having problems. Um, so it's really something that was created for um, to benefit a group that 
was underserved or more vulnerable in a, in a, in a way, but it's something that have, uh, has benefited us all, right? So that's the curb cut effect. And it's also can be um, referred to as universal design. So really what I'd like to uplift in this slide is as you're thinking about, um, as you're working with the public, engaging with them on activities or different projects or even a video call, thinking about the curb cut effect and everything, thinking about the most vulnerable groups and how, what you, what sort of techniques you can employ that would benefit them. It's a good thing to do and it'll also benefit the larger community at large. So designing your video engagement. So now we're getting to the exciting part. This is what I've been looking forward to all week. So I get to talk about how we can design a video engagement that's accessible to everyone. So there's three things that we need to look at. First, we need to look at what video platform we're using and wanna make sure that platform is accessible to as many members as possible. And then we also wanna be prepared before a presentation and during the presentation. So now we're gonna head and do a polling question. And we're gonna ask you what what video platform that you use the most? So the poll should be visible um, on your screen. Uh, you can check as many um, platforms um, that work for you. I'll just read out the polling question. It is, which video conferencing services do you use for your online presentations or calls? It's multiple choice. We have Google Meet, Microsoft Teams, WebEx, Zoom, phone conferencing, other, or none of the above. So just choose which ones you use. Let's see if it's the results are coming up. So I'm going to ask um, Evan if he sees them. So, no, I don't see the polling. Hi, uh, can you hear me, Nicole? Yes, I can hear you. Hi, uh, so I can announce the results. A very high voter turnout. We have 174 of 192 people, 90% voting. 90% uh, of you um, say you've used Zoom before. Uh, second place, all the way down to 27% is Microsoft Teams, Google Meet at 18%, WebEx at 15%, phone conferencing at 9%, other at 6%, and no one says that they have used none of those tools. Interesting. Very interesting. Thank you for that, Evan. Oh, thank you. I hopefully everybody can see the results now. Okay, Paul, back to you. Are right, you going to the next slide when you're ready? Sorry. Um, sure. So um, we thought it would be helpful to figure out to get a sense of um, your experience with video platform. Um, and which ones would be most helpful. So it's super helpful to know that you all are, are, are using a wide range of platforms and we'll talk about pretty much all of those um, in the subsequent uh, slides. So something that we really wanted to point out um, is that when you're creating your online presentation, you really wanna find a video platform that is accessible and you wanna be prepared prior to your, there's a lot of preparation that needs to go in um, and considerations prior to your presentation, as well as during your presentation. So Paul is gonna jump into um, sort of, um, he's sketched out a, a chart um, based on research and his experience in, in video platforms using um, a set of criteria that he's been thinking about and documenting accessibility um, with video platforms. So I'll turn to that. Okay, so what I was doing was trying to figure out the best way to talk about 
video conference platform. So there's four things that I want to look at. There are usability, screen readers, ASL interpreters, and closed captions. Can we go to the slide before this, please? Okay. So um, these are the four these are the four capabilities that we're looking for when we're looking at different video conference platforms. When looking at usability, usability is we want to make sure that people with intellectual disabilities can use a platform that's not complicated to access. We also want to look at can people with mobility disabilities use keyboard shortcuts and are they available to use? Because a lot of people with mobility disabilities not always, not always can use a mouse. Screen readers is a software that's typically used by blind people and other people with disabilities to use a computer. And what it does is turns text into words and words into text, um, words into voice. Then we have captions and ASL interpreters. Though they're two different features and they shouldn't, they're they not the same at all. So captions will show you words that are written in English while ASL interpreters will interpret words into sign language. It's always important to have both in your video conference platform. So I'm gonna explain more about captioning. So captions is the process of displaying text on the screen. Video conference platforms have two options for captioning. There's captions and there's captions there's live, there's live captions and captioning. Examples of live captioning is what you see on YouTube, for example, where you play the video and you turn the captions on and it displays the captions. A lot of times um, that's what, or if you watch a YouTube video or a TikTok, what have you, it always has the live captions. Then you also have captioning, which is what you see on TV and it's always 99% correct. And those are the two types of captioning that you should have available in your video conference platform. Lastly, there should be ASL interpreters should be able to appear and be pinned on a screen. So that way, if there's a deaf person, they can watch the interpreter. There's several video platforms that can be used. So in this presentation, I'm gonna be discussing four video platforms. There's Google, WebEx, Microsoft Teams, and Zoom. When we're looking at a video platform, we should judge it the same way we looked at that comment script that we saw earlier. The stairs, in, the stairs are accessible to some people and the ramp is accessible to everyone. Your video conference platform should be accessible to as many members of your audience as possible. And a good way to ensure accessibility is to have a person with a disability test the platform should also note that a lot of video conference platforms will say they have accessibility features, but we should always check how well these features work before we use them for a presentation. So now we're gonna to go to the next slide. Yeah, let me just see, we're having a little bit, um, there's a box uh -huh. currently. Let me, let me try something and get rid of that box. Just one moment, sorry. Is that better? Is the box yeah. moved now? Yes. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Okay. Sorry about that. Go ahead on slide 16. Next, All right. So people with, people with hidden disabilities, visible disabilities, and intellectual disabilities have different needs when it comes to video conference platforms. When you're choosing your video conference platform, you want to consider um, how each one of these works. So when I'm looking at each one, I want to look, what I did was, um, so I basically created a chart that looked at each one of these video conference platforms to see how they worked. With usability, I, uh, with usability, I found that Microsoft Teams and WebEx was very complicated for people with intellectual disabilities to use, very simple. When somebody, when a person with an intellectual disability um, wants to log into WebEx, they have to basically call a phone number and then put in a PIN number and then go to the website and it's a whole long process. Then with people, um, while Google Meet and Zoom have a simple way to access the conferences and have keyboard shortcuts available. Screen readers. 
As on that line, people prefer using Zoom or Google Meet since it allowed any version of a screen reader to be used. Websites and Microsoft Teams were also were only cheap, compatible with the newest version of a screen reader. So they have pluses and minuses. So you want to be able to use a platform that's accessible to many versions of the screen reader. So it's the same concept as if I have a new iPhone and iPhone 6 is going to like not update anymore, and then I'm not able to use it, but I'm able to use an iPhone 12, it's the same concept. So captioning. All four video conference platforms have the ability to use captions. When I looked at WebEx, I found that WebEx, the, the captions on WebEx did not always appear in the right place on the screen. With Microsoft Teams, you cannot have a third party join if you need a person to do your captions. With Google Meet, you could show who the speaker is with the captions, which is a great benefit because you can then identify who the person that is, who the person is that's talking. Then with Zoom, it allows to add a third party to be a captioner. And the cool thing about Zoom as well is that if your captioner for whatever reason is not able to attend or something happens to the captioner, Zoom allows you to have a person in your group become the captioner, which is a great benefit to have. Lastly, sign language interpreters. With your video conference platform, it's important that you're able to pin multiple videos. You want to be able to pin the ASL interpreters who work on a team of two and a hearing or deaf speaker. With Google Meet WebEx, you can only pin the interpreter. With Zoom, you can pin two interpreters and the speaker. So now we're gonna stop for questions. Yes, thank you, Paul. That was a lot of really rich information. Uh, we have several questions coming in and we'll take spend a few minutes answering them. Um, so this is a, a question from Miriam Rollin regarding terminology. Um, and Miriam asked about the term differently abled. Do you have any thoughts on that term, Paul? So differently abled is, I would definitely just look at people first language. It's definitely abled makes you sound like you're a different person and you're not a group, so you're different. Um, I would, I'd love to answer your question in an email later, maybe you can discuss that more. Um, I'd like to focus more on questions related to the inclusion and accessibility considerations. Yeah, that sounds good. We'll find those. Cool. Um, so a little bit more technical questions. Yes. Do, 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 do. There, are, there are a lot of ter uh, questions around terminology, but we'll hold okay. off. Okay, this is a good question, Paul, because I'm mm -hmm. not exactly sure either. Uh, so um, an anonymous attendee asks, how does a screen reader work? So a screen reader works is basically a voice active. It looks at a screen and it, it's able to capture the text and it turns the text into words. So you know how like you talk to Siri and Siri is able to answer your question. It's the same concept, but it's the opposite way. So the computer is basically, it, it's a program that you put into your computer and the words are basically read out. And then you basically move the mouse around and the mouse will be like on top of one screen and it'll read what's on that screen. Does that answer? Yeah, yeah I think it's good. Um, that person can, can uh, ch uh, chat if it wasn't sufficient. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a, another interesting question. Uh, Paul, what does it mean to pin an interpreter? So pin Jackie interpreter is asking that. Sure. So then if you look at your screen right now, you'll see that my screen is yellow and Nicole's is not. I want to be able to pin my screen and Nicole's screen so that both of us can be on the screen at the same time. If Nicole's is not, if I'm the interpreter and Nicole is the speaker, and I'm not able to see Nicole, it's gonna be confusing for the, the deaf person is signing and can't see the interpreter and won't be able to see the answers to the questions. So pinning means more to keep the picture of the interpreter on the screen and keep the picture of the speaker on the screen. Okay, that's good. Um, so, da, 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 da. Um, this isn't actually a about um, a platform per se, but it's actually, I think, a really good question and one sure. that I think about because I, I decided not to use a virtual background because I wasn't sure if that worked for other people. Um, so this 
person. Okay, let me catch that again. Um, Jenny Gilbert is asking a similar question. I'm wondering about the Zoom and other program fake backgrounds that people use. I understand that it allows people to have some privacy from sharing their homes, but I also find it difficult on the eyes to focus on them. Any thoughts? So yeah, that's definitely something to think about. You can mention that to your um, to your to the audience beforehand or your speakers beforehand. So um, it can be blurry. If you're signing and you're using ASL, yeah, that's going to be an issue because the background's going to mess up. The it can make your your signing blurry. So that's something to think about as well. Um, a lot of times. If you're with a lot of deaf people and there's a lot of people signing, they will they'll have like projected light and make sure the lights on the camera and they'll have a clear background that's not contrasting with the skin color of their shirt or their skin. So you want like a light background. If you have like white skin like me, you want to have like the background like this. So it's opposite of what my color is. Okay. So that's and a I, great question. Yeah. Um and I will um I'm going to uh, share this question. I think you, you're going to talk about it, but it might be, I think this could queue up some of your, your next um, pieces. So uh, Diana Vos Gonzalez asks, how do I know if somebody attending a virtual event has a disability? Is it okay to ask in the invitation? Should we have an option in the, re in the registration? So we're going to talk about that a little later. Um, you can say like you can just have all of your stuff ready beforehand or say like, okay, so if anyone needs some sort of reasonable accommodation, let us know. You don't have to point them out. Be like, is there any disabled people here? I want to know. That's kind of like putting people on the spot. You can just basically say like, does anyone, before I start my presentation, does anyone need a reasonable accommodation? Is there anything that I can do to make this um, presentation so that you can participate equally? Excellent. Okay, and I um, the yellow box is back, so I'm trying to get rid of it. I apologize for that. Um, so I'm gonna try and share again. Hopefully, it's gone, and then we'll jump into the next set. Apologize all again. Okay, hopefully it's gone. Okay, I think this is you, Paul. Or is it me? Is this you or me? So this is you. Paul? Yes. Is this my apologize? I think this is your section. Okay. Um, so what you were saying before oh, oh we, we've ended the questions, correct? Yeah, I'm sorry, Paul. I didn't I didn't make that clear. Um so okay. we'll we'll uh, we'll answer more questions after. I think okay. yeah. Got it. Okay, so what you were just asking me before was something that um, I'm going to talk about now. So before your presentation, one thing to do is to, to know that if you're in the United States, it's very important to understand that the ADA, under the AD, Americans with Disability Act, Title III, businesses are required to make reasonable accommodations for people with disabilities. If you do not, a reasonable accommodation is a modification that allows a person to, with a disability to participate equally. So you can do this by advertising an email or the flyer of your presentation uh, that you send out to people and include a blurb that tells your audience that a reasonable accommodation can be requested. So an example of this could be like a deaf person contacting you and saying, hey, I'm a deaf person and I need an ASL interpreter, can you provide one? Or I'm a blind person and if you could provide the documents in Braille, that would be helpful. Or could you put it in a large print for me? Or could you give me the presentation um, at, in, on paper because I don't like to read it off of a computer. There's all, those are reasonable accommodations that change it to make it for, so that everyone can participate equally. So then, then again, you want to also let your audience know that there's different ways in that same blurb. You can also let your audience know that there's different ways to access your presentation. So for example, somebody might not have internet access or a computer, and but they have a phone. You can show them that you can, you can access my presentation by using your phone and include the phone number in your, the email that you send out. Um, when you're looking at your slides for your presentation, you want to use slides that have high color contrast. 
you want to use 16 size fonts and you want to make sure that your images have alt text. Alt text is, is basically like a caption under a photo and the screen reader can read that and it can tell the blind person or um, it can tell the blind person what they're seeing. So I'll describe the image and it'll, it will show that the image says like this is a boy in a picture sitting down eating dinner or, or what have you. You also want to be prepared ahead of time and read the slides and images aloud to yourself before. So what I mean by this is you have images of graphs or pictures, try to make notes about them beforehand so that you're well prepared for it and you're not on the spot like, oh no, what do I do? I have to describe it. How can I describe it? Have it ready beforehand so that you can put um, effort into that to make it more clear. If you have videos in your presentation, check if they have captions before you play the videos. I've been to so many webinars where they have videos and there's no captions. So a lot of times it's frustrating if there's a long video in the, if there's a video in your presentation and there's no captions. So if you need to caption it, we can provide you with resources to find those captions, how to caption your video. You also wanna have a presentation document ready to give to your audience beforehand. And then you want to also have housekeeping rules such as meet your microphone and have a slide that shows you how to access the presentation or how to raise your hand feature, et cetera. Thank you, Paul. That was great. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some considerations during your video engagement. So oops. So the first thing is um, to really consider recording the session so that people have access to the video later. Um, so this isn't only for folks that um, are unable to attend your, your, your um, call or your, your conference. It's also for, for people that have attended and for them to be able to review the material in case they missed anything. Um, and there's also um, a feature where you, when to record the, the video, you can actually have a transcript. So it, it's um, another way for folks to receive the information. They can listen to it again and watch the video. They can also read the transcript. Um, we also wanted to provide a little bit of um, considerations around how to interact with people when you're actually um, on a sort of a video conference. Um, and for us, it's we thought it would be important to highlight that it's really important to let your audience know about the accessibility features that you are using for your presentation. So for example, in this presentation, we've been using captions, um, and that was something that we um, let, every, uh, I apologize for this, this orange box. Um, I'm going to try and get it get rid of it. I do apologize. I know it's distracting. Um, so letting people know about accessibility features, um, for example, the captioning that we that we offered. Um, and if you if you are providing for, for example, an ASL interpreter, that's also really um, important to let people know that interpreter will be um, on hand to make sure that the that the call or the, the video conferences is, is truly um, accessible. Um, it's also really important um, to consider the, the chat features. And that's something that we spend quite a bit of time thinking about, um, especially in a in let's say a webinar of this magnitude where there are um, you know, a couple hundred people on, you really cannot um, unmute, you know, you can't have a can have everyone with the ability to unmute themselves and speak at, at any moment because it would just be distract distracting. Um, so when so we opted to use a, a q a or a chat feature um but if you noticed um we're reading out the chat so that everybody can have access um there are times where where you will all be able to see the chats different conference if you choose the option that everybody can see the chat but maybe not everybody can see the chat so it is really important if you're using um different features like chat read out the chat if people, you know, sometimes there's a hand raise um, option or an emoji, just let people know that, um, you know, for example, you know, uh, Paul, I, I noticed that Paul is, um, you know, use the smiley emoji. And it just makes it more accessible that folks that are not able to see these different features can also participate. Um, 
the other interesting thing to just really consider is technology is always upgrading. And I can give a, a, a personal um, story. When um, Paul and I were, were designing this uh, conversation just a month ago, we were looking at Zoom and um, to hold it, and Zoom did not have closed captioning. And um, in January, they offer that service. So it's it's an interesting thing to watch as um, the needs are, as folks are advocating for their needs. Um, the, the technology um, companies are being receptive to it and just be, be, be aware that maybe a feature that wasn't available today might be available next week. Um, and something that's also really, really important when you have a slide, and we talked about the different learning styles and different ways that you can, um, you know, you can consider presenting information. When you do use graphics, it's really important to explain what the graphic is. So, for example, Paul uh, used uh, the amazing cartoon that really frames up the conversation. But he, if you remember, he walked you through um, exactly what was going on. So, if you're unable to see the graphic, he explained it so everybody can have access to it. And that's really important, you know, as we are using and incorporating different um, forms of multimedia, it's really important to consider, um, again, the accessibility. And sometimes you can just read it, you know, rather than considering not using it. Um, another thing that I wanted to um, point out is the when you're doing your interactions, and I think a lot of us always are thinking about the timing and breaking up the monotony, maybe showing a video, having a poll, opening up for questions, really being very considerate of the timing. I also would like to um, offer the suggestion when you have a long um, meeting or an engagement interaction, um, consider having breaks. Uh, we actually were thinking about breaking up this by having a break as well, but it, it didn't quite work out. But some of us, I think for, for many of us who have been on a call for more than an hour, two hours, it's really difficult to concentrate. And for many people, it, it is kind of in, inconsiderate. Um, so again, really consider the timing, the flow, and offering breaks to give people an opportunity to um, refresh and, and be able to um, you know, really be able to focus. And then just one more quick thing that we're not going to delve into, but we wanted to have a little polling question about this because it's a huge consideration. So again, as we're moving from face to face to more uh, virtual interactions, um, we're all trying to find ways to replicate what we did in, in person that worked well. So there's a whole arrangement of applications, polling applications, virtual whiteboards, um, virtual sticky boards that, um, that have popped up and are, are really cool to work with. But uh, you know, it's, it's a definitely wanna encourage others to consider, are they truly accessible? And again, we're not gonna delve into that content at all, but I did wanna um, have a quick poll to see if you all are using other applications in your virtual space that enhance the, the, the virtual uh, conference calls and meetings. So and one last quick poll, what other technologies do you all use in your online presentations? This is another multiple choice question. We have breakout rooms, polling applications within your, your video call platform. So for example, like this poll that we're using, polling applications that are sort of external, like Poll Everywhere or Mentimeter, do you use those? Uh, digital whiteboards within within your platform, so Zoom's whiteboard, to use digital whiteboards that are outside of the uh, platform, like Miro and Jamboard, to use other things, or do you not use anything? So just wanted to get a sense of what other virtual um, applications you all use to enhance your engagement. And if you could just uh, fill out that poll, and we'll just get a sense, uh, read of what you all are using in your work. And if it will give you a little bit of time to fill that out, um, Evan, if it doesn't pop up quickly, um, please feel free to read out the answers. All right, I'll go ahead and end the polling now and share the results visually, and I'll read them out for anyone who might be listening on the phone. So 77% of folks have used breakout rooms, 
56% of polling application, like what we're using right now within a video call platform. 27% uh, an external polling application like Mentimeter or Poll Everywhere. 24% digital whiteboards, 23% uh, or sorry, 24% digital whiteboards within a call platform, such as Zoom whiteboard, 23% an external digital whiteboard like Miro and Jamboard, 9% other, and 14% none. This is great. Thank you. This is great information. So as I said, we, we won't have uh, a lot of time to touch upon it, but as you're using breakout rooms, really consider um, are, are a variety range of people able to um, effectively um, utilize that, that application? Are they able to switch over and really participate? Are there considerations, accessibility and equity considerations that you should build into your work as you're using um, more platforms and more um, tools? Okay, so we are going to spend um, just a little bit of time um, the rest of our time um, answering some more conversations, uh, pardon me, answering some of your questions and um, any reflections that you want to share with us. Um, I'm going to direct most, uh, many of these questions to Paul, and we're going to try and stick with some of the more technical questions that, that um, he can answer. Let's see. Hmm. Um, so Jesse Foster asks, um, do you have any suggestions for addressing a large public group where you might not be able to ask everyone's preference? Do you have any thoughts on that, Paul? So again, I would send out an email to everyone saying like, what's the reasonable accommodations that you need and try to do it ahead of time. So give yourself like a week, send your, your email to the group a week ahead asking what the reasonable accommodations are. But then when you actually have your presentation, try to make it accessible anyway, because the whole, our discussion was that we wanna make everything accessible so everything is the same way for everyone so that as many people can participate. So if you already have your images described and you already have accessible slides, you already have an ASL interpreter, that's gonna attract more people to your presentation. So trying to make it more accessible invites more people. Thank you, Paul, for that. Um, this is interesting. Let's see if we can touch upon this. We can just share our thoughts. Um, mm -hmm. Lucy Bernholtz uh, is asked or stating um, that she's participated in meetings where people visually describe themselves when they introduce themselves. So they say um, their gender, their race, their per preferred pronouns, hair color, they're wearing glasses, no glasses, something about their background or their, their, or their clothing. And she finds that very helpful. However, asking people to identify themselves by race, gender can get complicated. Of course, so is leaving those categories out of course, uh, 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 but also of course is also leaving those categories out. Any advice on the intersectionality of those visual descriptions for web conferences? I would try to keep it as simple as possible instead of trying to ask so many questions to say like identify your name, who you are, or um, you don't have to describe everything, like everything visual about the person. If the person's comfortable describing what their race is, they're comfortable doing it, but the person um, describe themselves. So like I, didn't, it, it's always up to the person. That's what I say, like let the person decide how they want to identify themselves. That's great. Advice. And it's okay if the person doesn't say like, I'm a white person and I am from so-and-so and I have green hair. It just, they're just making it simple. Like I'm a man, I'm four years old and I live here. Or whatever, what have you. Okay, we've got a couple of questions. I'll lump them um, on recording. Um, one question, one person, Emily Goodson, she's asking, um, do you have any thoughts on balancing recording videos of your, of your meeting with attendees' privacy? Um, I would definitely kind of note that the events being recorded and if the person doesn't want to be recorded in a conference they can put their screen as black or just put a picture but not 
had their video on. Mm -hmm. Is that what you mean by the recording? And then I think it's important to ask the group first. Uh, it just depends. But if you already know the, the video is being recorded, then you should like let the person that's managing the webinar, let them know ahead of time mm -hmm. about the privacy. Yeah, and that's a really good question. And I am wondering um, if I'm understanding it right. So you have, so let's say if you, this is, I would assume a meeting. So this is a webinar where we can't see you all. We don't know who you all are, but you have um, times where you'll have a meeting on Zoom, for example, and you can see everybody's, um, you could turn on your video, you can see their, their picture or them live. Um, and their name or any other way that they identify themselves. So in those uh, interactions, you would let folks know for accessibility reasons, you're going to you're going to record it. And they're, you know, I assume by participating, they're authorizing the, the, the meeting to be recorded. But on the flip side, they could, they don't have to turn on their video. I think there's a separate issue about for um, requiring the video on. You don't have to require the video on. They don't have to put their picture and they can change their name to, or not have anything identifying themselves. So you have a, a question about recording and then the question about um, mandating a video, which, I, which maybe that's what I'm understanding, which could be two different issues. Um, there's another uh, question about videos. Do, 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 do. Where did I see it? I'm sorry. Um, I apologize, it disappeared. Um, uh, somebody's asking about um, other applications that allow you to, so I'll just read the question. I think the ability to watch back videos with saved viewings is very useful. Will these same services be available in rewatches? Can you speak to the recording capabilities of other applications other than Zoom? So I think maybe that's the easiest one. Are there other video conferencing platforms that have the ability to record? There are. Um, so my teams, with, I think with teams, you're allowed to record. Um, I think that's important, sorry about that. Um, with teams, you're allowed to record, I think. And it just you should just look at the video platform to check if it reports or not. I mm -hmm. don't have that information, but I know that like Zoom, you're able to record. Yeah, I think Google Meet you can record as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, some of um, and again, it I think what Paul is saying is right. You know, feel free to check with each platform because he can give you an answer. We can give you an answer now, and it might change um, soon. So it's best to check the platform to see which one works best for you. Um, so just a few more questions. I'm trying to figure out which ones we have not. Um, so there, there's some, there's a few questions about, I'm not sure if I completely understand them. Um, so Laura Ray is asking regarding, regarding, pardon me, alt text for images. I read once that if an image on a website is purely decorative, for example, a pretty sunset, you shouldn't include alt text. Is that correct? Do you have any uh, thoughts on that? I don't have an answer to that, but I could research it and email you back and to follow up with you on that. I'm not, I don't have an answer to that at this time. Okay. Sorry, I'm sorry about that. Um, oh, you go I can see the Q&A box, sorry. <laughs> um, so I was going through it. I'm gonna ask my team if there are any other um, final questions that we did not answer that we should touch upon. There were a few, um, some about legal, legal frameworks. Do we have any um, recommendations for uh, legal frameworks that could be used internationally? That, that's not our, our area of expertise. Um, so I wouldn't be able to share that information. If I, if I, if I can find it, that person can feel free to enter their email in. And if we do have information on that, we will share that. So well, I'm not sure if you can hear me. Uh, one question we have in from Leslie uh, Blazer. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. I ask if, um, Paul, you have any recommendations for streaming video to social platforms with an eye towards accessibility if you've had a better experience or know if folks have had a better experience using perhaps Facebook Live or YouTube Live or some of those services? So a lot of 
I don't have a accessibility feature issue. I have to look that up. I would have to look that up and I can get back to you on that. I wouldn't know offhand. Um, but I do know that like, for example, YouTube, you're able to capture new videos. Um, it just depends on what you're looking for in the software. Um, if you could just email me the question, I can try to find some resources for you. That's great. Any other last minute questions that we should address? There's one other asking if there are interpreter services that can be accessed by nonprofits or that offer perhaps nonprofit pricing structures. So I can actually answer that in the sense that um, a lot of a lot of interpreting agencies will give discounts to um, to nonprofits. They'll give them a less rate. You just have to tell them that you're a nonprofit, and they probably will like work with you. Um, it just depends where you're talking to and um, what organization it is. Uh, it just also depends. Like um, you always want to just check with them first. There's always like some way to get a discount from them. Thank you, Paul. Thank you everyone for your questions. Um, so before we wrap up, um, I wanted to um, invite you all to our next conversation in our series. Um, we'll be uh, having a conversation with three um, women of color who are leading in disaster recovery. Um, it will be held Wednesday, February 24th at 1 p.m. We can share the link as well, the registration link. We'll be speaking with, uh, again, three wonderful, powerful women. Um, the first is Maria Garrett. She's the executive director of a nonprofit in Brooklyn who really led the charge on um, disaster recovery as well as resilience after Superstorm Sandy. Um, we'll be also speaking with Myrtle Phillips, who's the executive director of Grand Bayou Families United. It is a very small grassroots nonprofit that serves the Grand Bayou uh, community, which is one of the most unique uh, places that I've ever been to. It is a fishing village, only accessible by boat in uh, Plaquemines Parish, Louisiana, which is actually where Hurricane Katrina made landfall. Um, and Ms. Myrtle is also the deputy chief of her uh, tribe, the Takapa Ishak tribe. So she has a wealth of knowledge to share on um, rebuilding and resilience um, from a perspective of a, an indigenous leader. And we'll also be joined by Daphne Viverette, who um, is the former community development director for the city of Moss Point, predominantly African-American city on the Mississippi Gulf Coast also uh, devastated by Hurricane Katrina. So she has the um, city, the sort of public sector um, view of rebuilding. Um, and the, the three, three of them will be sharing um, their experiences and it should be a really, really rich conversation. So I wanna extend an invite to you all and please share that with others. And then just finally to wrap up, um, I'm gonna share our contact information. Um, you can email um, me at Public Agenda at pe at public, P-U-B-L-I-C, A-G-E-N-D-A, publicagenda.org to discuss um, other ways that we can support your engagement needs. We um, at Public Agenda, we work on a variety of issues and we can really help you think through um, uh, embedding equity and inclusion in your work, especially around engagement and research. Um, we can help you with the design of your, your engagement strategies, as well as strategies for incorporating underrepresented groups and we also can help you think through digital engagement as well as some research considerations using um, focus groups, interviews, um, surveys, et cetera. And I'm really, really excited to, to say that um, going forward, we'll be working with Paul on these issues, especially around um, inclusivity. Um, so please do let us know if we can partner and really just strengthen um, engagement. And if you have specific needs around um, disability rights, disability sensitivity, please contact Paul at paulusquarry, P-A-U-L-U-S dot K-H-O-U-R-I at gmail.com. He is a consultant 
And he's, he's, he, as you can see, he's really just a wealth of information. So if you need consulting services around disability rights, disability sensitivity, please do contact Paul directly. But if you need help on engagement as well as inclusivity, contact me and Paul and I will be partnering to work and support you all um, on your, or find ways to partner and support you all on your work. For more information on Public Agenda, please check out our website, www.publicagenda.org. You can also find us on Twitter, at Public Agenda, Facebook, is it backslash Public Agenda, and that site, bit.ly, backslash Public Space Agenda, to sign up for our newsletter. So you'll get all the latest information on our, on our projects, on our free webinars, um, et cetera. Um, and again, thank you all for joining us for this is the first in a series of conversations. Um, and um, just really thank you all for, for spending some time with us on exploring these topics together. Um, Paul, do you have anything else that you wanna add? Um, someone asked a question about to re-explain what reasonable um, accommodation is. Mm -hmm. So reasonable accommodation is is making the whatever you're doing is making it um, equal, like to, so everyone can participate in the same way. So if it's like somebody needs an interpreter or a blind person needs successful documents, you want to make it so that everyone can equal, equally access it. Yeah, um, that was just a question I saw. But thank you everyone for all the questions. I look forward to getting emails from you and questions. And thank you everyone for participating today. Thank you. We'll be following up with you all with uh, the recording link, as well as the presentation um, and other information. So thanks again as well. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye.